Marvel's Spider-Man series is only a couple of games old, but they've both packed a hefty amount of story beats and character developments that will undoubtedly play into Spider-Man 2. So whether you played the original Spider-Man and Miles Morales and want a quick story refresher, or you're just jumping into Spider-Man 2, let's break down the story so far. Get more backup, and lock down the airspace. Yuri, you okay? If he makes it out of that building, we're gonna lose him. I'm gonna go, uh... Do your thing. Marvel's Spider-Man kicks off in the thick of the action with a classic fight between Spidey and the kingpin of crime, Wilson Fisk. When Fisk is being taken in by the cops, he does not come quietly, and so Spider-Man swings in to take matters into his own hands. Spidey climbs up and through Fisk's skyscraper base of operations before encountering the large lad himself, who he promptly webs up, hanging high and dry for New York City's finest to cart away. Side note, but there's actually a prequel novel to the game called Spider-Man Hostile Takeover, which details Spidey's ongoing battle with the Kingpin, as well as his investigations into an imposter Spider-Man who's swinging around NYC, giving him a bad reputation. With Kingpin dethroned, we meet Spider-Man's wider cast of characters. Chief among them Aunt May, who's working at a homeless shelter called Feast that's run by a benefactor called Martin Lee, a character who will come to have quite the impact across the first game. Dr. Otto Octavius, who at this point is Peter's boss at Octavius Industries, and Mary Jane, or MJ Watson, who's an ambitious reporter for the Daily Bugle, as well as being Peter's ex-girlfriend. The story really kicks into gear when Spidey investigates a silent alarm at an auction house selling all of Fisk's old stuff. When he gets there, he discovers a group of criminals wearing ominous looking masks and sporting a range of supernatural powers. And after bumping into MJ, who's also investigating for the Bugle, he manages to chase the gang off, but not before they get a secret document held within one of Fisk's prized statues. For his troubles, Spidey comes away from the encounter with one of the gang's masks, and he takes it to Martin Lee to get it checked out. Mr. Lee is something of an expert in the subject of creepy masks, which turns out to be a replica of an old Chinese variant, and he translates the text on the interior as demon. Anyway, Mr. Lee's somewhat spooked by the mask, and Peter comes away from the meeting with the feeling that it's more than just the creepy spectre on the mask's front that's gotten to his aunt's benefactor. Anyway, we fast forward to another investigation, this time with Officer Jefferson Davis, the father of another young hero by the name of Miles Morales. Spidey and Davis scour their way through a supposedly abandoned warehouse, which actually turns out to be housing a huge weapons cache, which the Demons gang are in the process of stealing. Spidey and Officer Davis manage to thwart the Demon Gang, and for his heroic efforts, Jefferson Davis is awarded a Medal of Honor by New York's mayor, who in this universe is Norman Osborn, the CEO of Oscorp, and the first and best known iteration of the Green Goblin in the comics. The ceremony does not go to plan though, as the demons attack the event under the leadership of a lad named Mr. Negative, who, surprise surprise, is actually Martin Lee, hence all the weirdness in that previous chat with Peter. In the ensuing chaos, Jefferson's son Miles jumps into action to try and save his father, but by the time he reaches him, his old pa has sadly already died. Miles is spared by Mr. Negative, and the demons flee the scene having thoroughly pooped the party. And with the demons having made their presence known in quite the public way, Osborne takes matters into his own hands and hires his own small army to help keep the peace in New York. This high-tech militia is run by Silver Sablanova of Sable Industries, and they almost immediately come to blows with Spidey, who's fortunately served by the timely intervention of his contact at the NYPD, Captain Yuri Watanabe. Spidey and MJ team up to investigate the demon's nefarious plans, and this leads them to the discovery of something known as Devil's Breath, which it turns out is actually a highly toxic bioweapon that was accidentally created by the scientists at Oscorp Industries. MJ's investigations lead the duo to discover the demon's plan to kill off all the scientists linked to Devil's Breath, which eventually leads the pair to an Oscorp exhibition at Grand Central Terminal and it's here where Mr. Negative triggers his grand plan, an attempt to get revenge on Norman Osborn by making the mayor trigger his own bioweapon, killing hundreds of hostages in the process. With Spidey's help, MJ manages to break free and defuse the Devil's Breath bomb, and after a subway set fight sequence that riffs heavily on the iconic train action set piece from Spider-Man 2, Mr. Negative is defeated and shipped off to a maximum security prison known as the Raft. All of which brings a relative calm to New York for a hot minute, which seeing as the story is only about 58% done at this point, likely won't be lasting. <laughs> Thank you.
Meanwhile, Peter continues on with his day job as a lab assistant to Otto Octavius, who's working on cutting-edge research into new prosthetic technology. After a corporate ambush from his old partner turned rival Norman Osborn nearly shuts Otto down, he calls in a few favours to keep the lights on, and this leads him to making some big breakthroughs in his new limb designs. But you see, Otto has something of an ulterior motive, as he's hoping his new prosthetic creations will help him cope with his dwindling motor neuron disease. I think we can all see where this is going. Yep, Otto's rage at his former partner combined with his failing body send poor Octavius over the edge, and when he finalises his extra appendages, he jumps headfirst into the world of supervillainy. And that piece I mentioned just a second ago comes to a shocking end when our mate Otto, now calling himself Dr Octopus, triggers a huge scale prison break at the Raft prison complex, which allows all of Spidey's worst mates including Rhino, Electro, Vulture and Scorpion to break free along with a hundred odd inmates in the process. Add to this the recently incarcerated Mr Negative and of course Doc Ock, and Spidey's got himself a new look Sinister Six to worry about, and they promptly ask him politely to stay out their way. And by politely I mean they beat the ever living crap out of poor Spidey. Stay out of our way. And with the Sinister Six out in the open, the shit truly hits the fan in New York City, with all-out warfare kicking off between the escaped inmates, the police, and of course Silver Sable's private militia. And to make matters even worse, Doc Ock has managed to get his hands, or should that be tentacles, on the Devil's Breath, and he wastes no time in spreading its toxicity throughout New York City. Despite nursing a dozen broken bones, Spidey gets to work, and with half the city, including poor Aunt May, struggling with the Devil's Breath sickness, he's very much against the clock. As Devil's Devil's Breath ravages through the city's population, Spidey methodically takes down the B-tier villains of the six escapees, namely Electro, Vulture, Rhino and Scorpion, and with all of them behind bars he turns his attention to more pressing matters. A little sports together time might help you boys learn to play nice. Pressing matters like a cure for Devil's Breath, which MJ eventually tracks down during an infiltration of Norman Osborn's penthouse suite. She finds a little more than she bargained for though. Firstly, she discovers the real reason why Harry Osborn, MJ and Pete's best friend growing up, isn't knocking about in the game. You see, Harry's mum died of a rare disease, which turns out to be genetic, and poor Harry is suffering from it too. MJ learns that he's supposedly abroad at a clinic to help him with his illness, and I'm being purposely vague here as this plot point will crop back up again later. Anyway, MJ escapes the suite by the barest of margins, but she's not alone. While in Norman's secret lab, she accidentally knocks over a cabinet of genetically engineered spiders, and one hitches a ride on MJ's shoulder. Again, this will become relevant shortly. With the lab's location discovered, Spidey hightails it over there only to bump right into Mr Negative, who's taken Norman hostage. After a prolonged boss battle, Spidey eventually defeats Negative only for Doc Ock to crash the party. With Mr Negative on the ropes and reverting to good old fashioned Martin Lee, Otto nabs Norman and the Devil's Breath Cure and disappears into the night. After a classic bad guy revenge monologue at the top of Oscorp Tower, Otto drops Norman to his death, only for Spidey to swing in at the last minute to save the egotistical billionaire. And so begins the final boss fight, a classic bout between Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus, which takes place atop and down the sides of a skyscraper. I won't let you win. When Spidey inevitably wins, he leaves a bruised and broken Doc Ock nursing his pride before he's carted off by the police to the raft. Spidey nabs the cure and speeds his way back to Aunt May, but when he gets there he's too late to save his last remaining family member. Facing a gruelling choice between wasting the cure on his aunt alone or to help the people of New York, Pete chooses the latter, and so Spider-Man ends with yet another funeral. Only there are a number of epilogues that bookend the first Spider-Man game, the first of which shows Pete and MJ reconciling their relationship and getting back together, which is nice. The second brings us the revelation that the hitchhiking spider on MJ's coat has found its way to Miles Morales, bitten him and given him superpowers just like Spidey's. And finally we have the revelation that Harry Osborn was not abroad all along, and that his father is holding him in some sort of back to tank like setup, while he looks for the cure to his son's genetic disease. And what's that weird black substance clinging to him. Could that be classic Spidey villain Venom? Most certainly. Looks like a pretty normal painting to me. It is. There's way more valuable stuff in that museum. So why is the Magia so worked up about this painting? After the revelation-heavy ending of the main campaign, the DLC story expansion The City That Never Sleeps takes place a few months later, in a New York City that is waking up to a power vacuum left by Wilson Fisk's arrest. 
Anyway, TCTNS, which is a horrible acronym to say, kicks off with a relatively low-key art heist in the first of three chapters, simply named The Heist. Spidey attempts to thwart an art museum break-in from Black Cat, who's seemingly there to nab a painting, but who's actually there to grab a USB drive that's lodged in the frame. And from these seemingly small origins, kicks off a grand tale of gang warfare between the various Magia crime families across the city. Caught up in the middle of all this is Black Cat, who's being extorted by the Frankenstein's mobster that is Hammerhead, to help him by holding her son hostage. It's heavily insinuated that the kid might be Spidey's on account of a fling between the pair years ago. If they spot me, my son's dead. Spoilers, that's all a lie, there is no son, as Black Cat strings Spider-Man along as a means to use him to help her get critical intel on Hammerhead's crime syndicate. Naturally, Hammerhead doesn't take too kindly to all of this, and he orders his men to kill Black Cat, a conversation that Spidey overhears while stuck inside one of the mobster's vaults courtesy of Black Cat's betrayal. He tries to warn her about Hammerhead's plans, but can only watch on as she seemingly dies in an explosion at her rooftop apartment. <laughs> And the first episode of the TCTNS ugh, ends with Spidey relieved that he's not a father, while confused by the mysterious circumstances surrounding Black Cat's supposed demise. The upshot of all of that is a full-blown gang war between the Magia crime families, with the Hammerhead Syndicate having the distinct advantage of a boatload of stolen Sable weapons and technology. As per usual, Spidey is thrown headfirst into the middle of the battle, and he witnesses an absolute police massacre at the hands of Hammerhead and his gang, which leaves just himself and Captain Yuri Watanabe as the sole survivors. With Yuri reeling from losing all her troops, Spidey suggests she takes some time off to grieve while he goes after Hammerhead. Spidey's investigations lead him to discover that the flat-headed mobster has kidnapped the heads of the Magia crime families and intends to execute them live on TV. Spidey is led all across NYC on a merry trail of false info, all while Hammerhead launches an assault on the police precinct in order to steal the Oscorp-funded Project Olympus, which turns out to be a great hulking mech suit. Long story short, Yuri comes back from her leave to find everything in a worse place than it was before, and she takes matters into her own hands. You see, our friend Yuri has a personal vendetta against Hammerhead, who was bribing her father way back when. She goes on something of a murderous rampage, which isn't, you know, standard protocol for cops, and this all culminates when she interrupts the climactic fight between Spider-Man and Hammerhead. Arriving at the scene, Yuri traps Spidey before nearly killing Hammerhead in cold blood. I say nearly, as he's later revived by one of his goons who's infiltrated the NYPD. Yuri, meanwhile, is ordered on administrative leave, but she fails to get her man one way or another. The final chapter, Silver Lining, sees Silver Sable return to NYC to reclaim all her stolen tech and weaponry from Hammerhead, who's now gone full cyborg in his bid to retain power on the streets of the city. Sable and Spidey decide to team up to stop Hammerhead after the latter tries to stop the former from going on an all-out rampage, which could lead to some pretty hefty clash damage. The pair eventually get caught in one of Hammerhead's traps, which Spidey is saved from via the timely intervention of the decidedly not-dead Black Cat. Sable isn't so lucky, and she's taken hostage in Hammerhead's sewer lair. Spidey, now with the lowdown on Hammerhead's core weakness, courtesy of Black Cat, saves Sable, and the pair take the fight to the cyborg monster with a great big freaking laser beam to the head. <laughs> Anyway, long story short, they finally overpower Hammerhead aboard Sable's invisible stealth boat on the Hudson River, and with her property reclaimed, Sable heads back to her home of Simcaria to aid her people who are fighting a brutal civil war. And the city that never sleeps ends with a little prologue of Miles beginning his training with his new spider abilities, which leads us right into... That is so cool. Yep, it's time for Miles to take centre stage. A year or so has passed since the events of the first game and Miles has become more accustomed to his new powers, but despite all his training, he hasn't fully mastered his abilities. His skills are very much put to the test during a convoy mission to escort Rhino back to prison, a mission that goes sideways quickly, when Rhino breaks free and then breaks well, half of New York City, and very nearly Spider-Man, the Peter Parker flavour that is. These dire circumstances stir new unknown bioelectric powers within Miles, which helps him defeat Rhino against all odds. And with Rhino back in the custody of the NYPD, Peter drops the bombshell on Miles that he'll be leaving with MJ to take a working vacation to Simcaria, which will leave Miles as New York's only Spider-Man. 
He leaves him with a parting gift though, a brand new suit so Miles can truly look the part of a friendly neighbourhood Spider-Man. Anyway, if you couldn't tell from all the lights strewn about the place and the healthy dusting of snow on the streets, it's Christmas. Miles heads home to his family's new Harlem apartment for a very wholesome Christmas Eve dinner with his mum, his new best mate Genke, and a surprise visit from his old best mate Finn, who's been AWOL for the last few months. That'll come into play in just a sec, keep watching. Despite all the Christmas cheer, the streets of NYC are still a constant war zone, and this time it's a fight between the new energy provider on the block, Roxon, and a rival guerrilla organisation known as the Underground. Roxon, run by the incredibly slimy Simon Krieger, also has a high-tech private militia by the way, which is a thousand percent a red flag for an energy provider, but it's supposedly all in the name of good clean energy in the form of their new power source which is known as Newform. After helping his uncle Aaron out on a routine task to get NYC's subway back up and running, Miles reveals his identity to Aaron after a lucky guess from his uncle. This will also be important in a little while. Miles then finds himself right bang in the middle of the war between Roxon and the underground when the latter raids the former during his mum's campaign rally to become a counsellor. This conflict all leads to a big showdown on Braithwaite Bridge, where Miles thwarts the underground from stealing a shipment of Roxon's new form energy. Unfortunately, his new bioelectric powers short out the power source, which nearly brings the whole bridge down. Miles fully takes up the mantle of Spider-Man by rescuing anyone and everyone on the bridge, but his PR takes a big knock as a result of his destructive power. The other key revelation on the bridge is the news that one of the underground's key players, the Tinkerer, is actually Miles' childhood friend Finn, news that really brings Miles down to earth. After an uplifting pep talk from Ganke and a handy montage, Miles builds himself a fancy new spider suit, and he swings back into action to investigate what exactly is going on between Roxon and the Underground. Long story short, Finn's older brother Rick used to work for Roxon and was instrumental in the creation of Newform. The reason why I say used to work is that Newform is actually lethal, and slowly poisons anyone who comes into contact with it, including most of Rick's research team and Rick himself. Miles learns all this when he infiltrates one of Roxon's facility, where he's joined by, of all people, his uncle, whose alter ego is the Prowler. Damn, Miles. We're skinny ass kid. You hit hard. Uncle Aaron? Together they discover that Rick was killed by Simon Krieger, who sought to take control of Newform and take the credit for its creation. On the suggestion of his uncle, Miles meets up with Finn with a view to infiltrate the underground, where he learns that Finn is the brains behind all their highly advanced weaponry. Her endgame is to get revenge on Krieger for the death of her brother, which the Underground will aid her in. Anyway, while undercover with the Underground, Miles dons his spider suit but has to reveal his secret identity to Finn when things go south. Naturally, this somewhat puts an obstacle between the pair in their revived friendship, but this all becomes a moot point for the meantime when a Roxxon supercharged Rhino comes charging back onto the scene to capture the pair. The pair eventually escape, with a fresh load of story revelations weighing them down in the process. For starters, Miles discovers that his uncle has been spying on him for Roxxon, and that Krieger has modified his own Harlem new form reactor to destroy the whole neighbourhood if it is sabotaged in any way. This devastating sequence of events comes to a head with another final with the Rhino where Finn nearly beats the giant Russian to death before Miles intervenes. Finn knocks Miles out and makes a hasty exit. We're reaching the end game of Spider-Man Miles Morales which really kicks into gear when an injured Miles is saved by Ganke and taken home. There his mum learns of his true identity as Spider-Man and while the revelation shocks her she vows to support her son's mad heroics. After resting up, Miles swings back into action only to be caught by his Uncle Aaron as the Prowler. It turns out that Uncle Aaron is just being overprotective of his nephew, fearing that he might lose another family member in the process of Miles' crusade against Roxxon and the Underground. After Miles fights back against his uncle, Miles implores Aaron to help him in his fight, and his uncle eventually agrees, and aids in evacuating Harlem during the escalating war. Miles hightails it to cut off Finn from accidentally destroying Harlem and has to fight her when he's unable to get through to her amidst her lust for revenge. Miles' pleas soon become very obvious and Finn is unable to control the power of the new form reactor after she tinkers with it. Realising that she's made a grave error, Finn agrees to help Miles in saving the situation and she flies him up a safe distance so that he can release the power source without blowing up Harlem. Unfortunately, Finn is killed in the process, but Miles survives by the skin of his teeth as he plummets back down to Earth. Upon landing, his secret identity is again revealed to some of the citizens that he's just saved, but they all promise to keep their lips sealed on who he really is. 
And Miles Morales comes to a close with a short epilogue that takes place four or so weeks later, where it's revealed that Roxxon's dirty laundry has been aired in public, resulting in a handful of lawsuits being thrown at the energy company. Simon Krieger has also been arrested after being betrayed by Aaron, who turns himself in so he can testify against the slimy energy tycoon. And finally, Peter returns from abroad and the pair swing off to start fighting crime as a duo once again, which naturally leads us right into the events of Spider-Man 2. But first, one last little mid credit sting, which sees Norman Osborn turn up for the first time in this game. Here we get a small development of the ongoing storyline with Norman's sons Harry and his genetic disease, now with added Kurt Connors, aka the Lizard or soon to be I guess, maybe. Either way, Norman orders a hesitant Connors to release his son from the Bacta tank, but for what reason? I guess we'll find out in Spider-Man 2. And that friend should have you all caught up going into Spider-Man 2. I hope you enjoyed this recap, and if you like lore deep dives, make sure to subscribe to GameSpot as we've got plenty of lore-based videos on the channel. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.